So hi there and welcome to episode 80 of Business Buying Strategies. It feels like a bit of a milestone. Uh, I'm here with Jonathan Jay on a Zoom meeting and we continue to be in lockdown. Jonathan, how's your week been? Oh, it's been a good week. I, I actually hoped to, uh, so we're recording this on Good Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually hoped to complete on my first Corona deal, um, as I'm <laughs> calling it, uh, yesterday, although as usual, it gets to like four o'clock, the sun was shining, the lawyers were probably in their gardens, um, and uh, we didn't complete. So that'll be uh, on, on Tuesday next week. And this is a uh, day nursery business? Yes, it is. Yeah. So, so half a million uh, revenue a year. Um, uh, on on a on a on a no money down uh, basis, um, really really simple to to do, very very fast as well, um, and uh, yeah, just these these things always get delayed at last minute. There's, there's always something there's always something missing, um, but uh, we'll 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 close that one on Tuesday. Excellent, excellent. Well, best of luck, and you've got the uh, the the weekend to be ready for it. Uh, any Easter weekend plans in your lockdown uh, status? I, I hear you've been I hear you've been exercising very strongly. <laughs> yeah, is there a difference between the weekend though and the week? There is no difference, right? So uh, it's, um, I'm struggling to remember what day of the week it is each time. Each time I'm sitting at my desk, because every day is the same. It's quite true. It's, it's interesting because I I um, have discovered that I don't need to go to so many meetings, um, and we can do meetings like this on on Zoom. It's very very time efficient. So in some ways, actually, I'm getting I'm getting more done uh, in less time. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we we genuinely whatever else comes out of this, we will all work in very different ways in the future. All those excuses and reasons why, yes. oh no, you can't possibly remote work or work from home. We need you here in the office. Well. They've gone out of the window, really, haven't they? And all the people who say they don't have time to buy a business, um, well, you do have time. It's about how you manage your time and the people around you and how efficiently you work. And, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can do anything if you set your mind to it. If you want it enough, you can always find the time. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Now, you and I have been talking about how to uh, keep going with podcast content during time uh, – the troubled times and one of the things that uh, we we discussed is actually there are a number of businesses that you personally have bought and sold over the years that you don't often uh, discuss and talk about you teach people how to buy and sell businesses but why should people listen to what you say well what what's your credibility what's your what what's the history why should i trust you to teach me how to buy and sell a business well i hopefully if you if you've listened to 80 podcasts <laughs> then by now you should have figured out whether i know what i'm talking about or not but i think that you know there are clearly you know, there are people around the world who who do training on on buying a business either in a university type setting or in a more sort of public public setting uh, and I don't know much uh, uh, about them. And I'm sure they've, 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 they have, they've bought, they've sold. Um, but my deals seem to have been somewhat substantial in comparison. Right. Um, and the, the the first major exit when I was I get this right, I was either 32 or 33. Um, made me a multimillionaire as a result of 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 that deal and that was actually a, a combination of acquisitions that i um uh, that i sold uh, i think we're going to talk about that on a on a future on a future podcast so i, I could i can speak from experience that that's a pretty good starting point for for most things but experience not in um, you know, buying this business over here, there's 150,000 revenue and buying that one over there, there's 250,000 revenue. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about the, 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 the big, the big ones as well. Mm, mm, excellent. Excellent. So I'd like to talk about one particular set of businesses that you bought and sold. Uh, you, it, what, five years ago now? Uh, owned and then sold a group of digital marketing businesses. Yes. Tell me some more about those. Okay. So, um, so, so the background is that uh, over a period of years, uh, I 
I, I had some startups mm -hmm. and I had um, acquired some very old businesses. I think the oldest was 30 years old, all in the, the marketing space. Mm -hmm. And then um, one particular opportunity came along that really turbo boosted everything. And I think that's what we're going to focus on today because I speak about this when I do my uh, three hour live seminars, of course, right. won't be one of those uh, anytime soon. Uh, but I never really, I only have typically sort of five, six minutes to talk about it. So I thought we right. could talk about it in, in more depth here because it was complicated. Uh, the, the seller was a private equity firm and, and that never makes things uh, easy. Um, the buyer was a trade buyer. Um, that was a little bit more uh, straightforward. Uh, and what, what, to give you the, the, the headline on it, uh, it was a, a, a group of businesses that I bought for one pound from their private equity owner. So, you know, sometimes people... I've got to, I've got to interrupt. I've yeah. got to interrupt and say, why would a private equity owner sell you a group of businesses for a pound? Why didn't, you just hang, ha, why didn't the private equity uh, group just hang on to those businesses? Okay, so... A, a, the typical fund life is five years in private equity. So the investors put their money in for a five-year uh, right. period, and at the end of the fund's life, um, everything in the fund has been uh, has been sold, and then uh, the, um, the the carry it's called the carry the profit from those sales uh, is distributed to the original uh, investors plus the fund managers, the private equity people. Um, so. We we're coming up to the end of a particular fund's life, and this one investment hadn't worked at the scale that they wanted it to work at. And that isn't unusual. I mean, you know, if you've got 12 companies in a fund, you know, you're going to get two or three that limp along. Um, this particular uh, fund was a buy and build fund, which meant that they buy a platform investment, um, and then they... Uh, uh, um, Find other investments to, to to bolt onto that platform. Okay, and this okay. was a platform investment that cost them fifteen million. So this was a fifteen million pound acquisition that they made, uh, and just under five years later, they sell it to me for a pound. Um, so I'm saying that to to show you the value that was placed on it when it was bought. Now the business is actually. Um, reduced in size during that period because of lots of different reasons. The the main reason being extremely poor management. And, um, uh, and and as a result, coming up to the end of the fund's life, it was, well, we just need to get rid of this. Um, and, uh, and, and I placed myself um, in, 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 in position to be that, that acquirer, um, and we, we, we did the deal. I need to ask you another question, which is the reason you were interested in it, because at the time you owned a marketing business yourself? Yes. Uh, well, partly that and partly because this business had recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is where you collect money from your customers, typically on direct debit, every single month. And those contracts are either long contracts or they're rolling contracts so that you might sign a customer up today and in three, four, five years time, they're still paying you their monthly fee for whatever okay. service it is that you're providing. Okay. So. Um, so, and that's very appealing because when you sell a business with recurring revenue, you uh, usually get a better deal because the buyer has visibility over those revenues, can project forward, and that's far better than transactional revenue, which is you buy something and you hope that someone else is going to come along and buy something from you and someone else is going to come along and buy something for you. Here, you make one sale and then you get the repeat revenue for, forever. I get the appeal of the recurring revenue. I just want to get into the head of a potential deal maker here. You owned a marketing business, which presumably was trading perfectly profitably and successfully, and you saw an opportunity to add, bolt onto it, another business which had recurring revenue. Is that right? Uh, yes, if you, if you want to put it like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, yes, and, and, and quite frankly, when you see an opportunity like that uh, that you can buy for a pound, why wouldn't you do it? When, were you when, looking when you're for a business to buy at the time, or did it just? I was actually I went to a dinner, and 
Uh, I don't usually go to these networking dinners, but this one was at a, 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 a very nice venue. Uh, I can't actually remember what the venue was, but I remember being inside the building and thinking, this is, this is very, very attractive. Nice and place I talked to, be. to someone. Sorry? Nice place to be, it sounds. Yes. So I, I, I went along for the, um, for the ambience as much as, as anything. And I was talking to someone before the dinner and uh, he asked uh, which sectors I was interested in. And he said, have you heard of this particular company? Uh, the company was uh, Creare Communications. He said they're owned by private equity, the owners are sovereign, um, sovereign capital partners. Uh, and I, I jotted this down on my phone. And then the taxi on the way home that night, I, I looked at their website and thought, this is actually quite interesting because quite often people uh, mention companies that they think would be of interest to you, but when you look, you know, they, they just aren't yeah. what you thought they were going to be. But this one was absolutely spot on. Uh, so I, th- the next morning, I asked um, someone that I know in corporate finance to phone the private equity people um, and ask them if they were interested in uh, and this is the twist, actually, interested in acquiring my digital marketing businesses because you know, this is a, a private equity firm with a, with a, uh, whose, stra- whose strategy is buy and build. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the response came back almost immediately, which was, no, we're not interested. Uh, in actual fact, we're more interested in disposing of this. Right. <laughs> so then, right. You, you, then you've got to think to yourself, how do you make the approach without looking too keen and without looking as though you, um, uh, you, you because a keen buyer always pays a, a poor price yeah. uh, because, because you know, you, how, how can you negotiate well when you clearly want something? So I went onto LinkedIn, put the name of the company into LinkedIn, discovered I was connected to um, one of their directors, never met the guy, but um clearly was connected to him for some reason, uh, sent him a message saying, shall we meet up for a coffee? Because I think we might be able to pass some clients over to you. Possibly there might be a, a reciprocal arrangement there. So he comes along for a coffee. Uh, I get to understand the business a bit better. That's when I really understand the the way they do their recurring revenues. It was very, very helpful. Um, gave me lots of um, intelligence uh, about the business. And uh, as a result of that meeting, he set up a meeting with for me with the uh, the CEO, um, the CEO um, uh, very again very pleasant, very very open, mm-hmm. and I said, well, why don't we join forces? I mean, maybe maybe there's something the two companies can do together. And he said, no, no, no. He said we're not really interested in that. He said we're more interested in selling. Now, of course, I already knew this. Yes, yes. But you don't want to let on that you know, do you? And. Uh, he said, we're owned by, by private equity, um, and I think we're interested in, in selling. I said, well, I might be interested in buying. So the idea came from him rather than from me. Very clever, yeah. So, so the dynamics were better than me going, hey, would you like to sell me your business? And I get asked this question a lot, actually, on LinkedIn in particular. Where people say, yeah, how do you approach a business that you're interested in buying? Well, the best way is to get them to approach you. I mean, we've got some, some tactics uh, to, to help that situation occur. So, so uh, he said you need to meet uh, the chairman. So I met the chairman. The chairman uh, showed me all the financials, and the financials were actually on the surface horrific. <laughs> so uh, he prefaced uh, showing me um, the uh, profit and loss by saying, uh, "I don't want you to misinterpret the numbers." I always think that's interesting. People that's say, "I don't want to misinterpret yeah, the numbers." I can imagine. <laughs> So the, the business has made a trading loss of 300,000 on 4.7 million of revenue. So 4.7 million of revenue, 300,000 pound loss on, on that. However, I knew why they'd made a loss. They'd made a loss because they were doing things that didn't make a profit. And I, I know that sounds like complete common sense, but they were just doing things that didn't make a profit and that eradicated the profit that was being made elsewhere. The profit was being made on the recurring revenue. Um, and the, the, the loss was being made on the transactional parts of the business. So this is why my head was completely focused on this recurring revenue piece. And then he showed me the balance sheet. Now, remember, the balance sheet shows what the company owns and it shows what the company owes. And it owed. 
far more than it owned. So it was balance sheet negative to the tune of 20 million pounds. Now, most people would run a mile when they would see that. They'd say, well, 20 million pounds, how on earth? Um, yeah. you know, why on earth would you be interested in a business with a, 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 a negative position? So, but when you dug a little bit deeper, you understood exactly why it was negative. It was negative because of uh, um, there were some some uh, HMRC liabilities. There were some tax avoidance type schemes that were oh, going yeah. okay. when they'd been uh, introduced five years earlier, but now have been um, uh, tightened up on by HMRC, and HMRC were calling in the debt. So there was like a million pounds of that, um, and then what the what the owners had done is they put that um, that initial 15 million that they bought the business for into the business's debt so they were owed 15 million back out plus there was accruing interest which was another 3 or 4 million so it all added up to about 20 million mm. so understanding the nature of what it is that you're that you're buying is is really uh, quite important because something can look terrible on the surface. And I think one of the, the key points, I just want to link this to this recession that we're about to, to enter, is that there are going to be lots of businesses for sale, lots of business owners who want to sell that have appalling PL and a terrible balance sheet, and it all looks like an awful mess. But this is the key thing. The underlying business was sound. Right. The underlying business was very, very solid indeed uh, because of this recurring predictable yeah. revenue. I mean, the business was vastly overstaffed, um, terribly managed. I mean, it, yeah, if, it, if it had gone wrong, it had gone wrong. But the underlying business was still very, very appealing to me. Um, I've got to ask, the private equity company, did they not have a duty, if you like, to make sure that the business was being managed more effectively? Yeah, I, I, I would imagine they thought it was being managed effectively. And even if they thought it wasn't, they would never admit, would they? No one's ever going to admit that they hired terrible, terrible managers. Um, so I think they I acted in absolutely in good faith. Um, you know, the, I, I'm, if, if there's any blame being apportioned to the poor running of the business, it's the it's always going to be the people there on the ground running running it, and and um, you know ra rather than the 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 the, the parent company. So, sorry, okay. actually, no, no, okay. So I, then then I've got to ask. You often talk about one pound deals as no money down, but then there is a purchasing process that takes place out of. Uh, refinancing assets out of okay. uh, this sounds like it wasn't one of those. No, it, it was a pound. Uh, so, so we did two things. We bought the shares for a pound, yes, and we bought the assets. Uh, sorry, um, not the assets. The um, uh, the debt, the liabilities for a pound. So, so the the debt to the the the, the fifteen million plus the interest. We bought that loan note. For a pound. Okay. Yes. So okay. now, here's the thing. And, and I believe, I mean, it's casting my mind back a few years here, but I believe I bought that loan note personally, which meant that the company now owed me 18, 19 million pounds, which is not a poor position to be in. Now, because I'm never going to call in that debt, because I'm never going to say, I want my 19 million pounds, give it to me, then in actual fact, it was it was a very safe position to be in. And of course, you wouldn't want to buy the business without buying that loan note because that's kind of key to making this deal yeah. work. Gotcha. And there were so many moving parts. I mean, I've got to mention, I think there were 27 uh, different shareholders. And I had wow. to go to each of those 27 different shareholders and convince them to sell me their shares for effectively nothing. I mean, there were some of them were in groups. So there was like a... You know, three or four in this group. Some of them were ex-members of staff um, who'd forgotten that they, they <laughs> held 0.01% shares in the business. Um, and and uh, yeah, so so we, we ended up with a whole group of companies. So we, 
we had a franchise company. We had, I think it was five franchises around the UK selling digital marketing services. Um, we ended up with 50% of a, a, a digital marketing agency in Brisbane, Australia. Um, uh, that was an interesting uh, part of the deal. Um, and we, we, we just ended, we ended up with this whole collection of businesses. So over the next six months, we had to rationalize it down because I was only interested in that core of, Got you. Got of, you. of um, recurring revenue. I want to talk about those six months, but before I do, how much time had elapsed between that dinner when you yes. heard the words Creare and the sign-off of the acquisition? 12 weeks. Okay, nice. It nice. should have been quicker, but it was just always going to be made more complicated because they're not going to make... Yeah, you know, it's private equity. <laughs> they, yeah. It's not. It's not going to. It's not. It's never going to be as easy um, as you as you think it might. Think it might be. Or think it of should. Of course. Of course. So you acquired the business. Now let's talk about those six months. You'd acquired all these various strands that 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 you kind of weren't even aware you'd bought in a way. Talk me through the yeah. six months when you rationalised to get down to the bit you actually wanted. The, the key is you've got to move really quickly. Because procrastination is not, there's no place for procrastination. And I always say, if you want to buy businesses, you've got to be someone who can make a decision. Because if you can't make a decision, do you want it or you don't want it, then you'll faff around and the, either the opportunity will slip through your fingers, um, but the opportunity won't improve by constantly thinking about it. Right. So we had to move really quickly. So um, you know, I'm just giving you the headlines of, of what happened here. So we, we unfortunately had to make 75 staff redundant. Okay, now, okay. Um, I got my uh, HR people to deal with all of that. Everyone left with every penny that they were owed. Uh, no one was out of pocket at all. Uh, and many of them were looking at other jobs anyway, because they kind of knew that it was a bit of a downward spiral at the business. No one was surprised. Uh, and we did that within a, um, you had to do a consultation, but kind of you know, people were leaving regardless of the consultation period. So, so that all happened within the first sort of six weeks or so. Um, we moved to smaller offices with our smaller, I think we had about 12 staff. So we, what did we start off with? It was eight, 80 something staff, I think. So we had 12 staff in a smaller office, um, uh, rid ourselves of the management team that immediately saved a million pounds of cost with them, their right. PAs right. and their PAs assistants, like three layers, all gone. And we did this very, very quickly um, and painlessly. I mean, this isn't uh, a situation where you, you know, these are human beings. You don't, you don't want to cause anyone unnecessary upset, but we're saving the business, saving the customer contracts. Um, and an actual fan, I think in many ways, service improved because now there were six or seven account managers rather than 30. Um, and it all just worked so much smoother. Uh, I think some people had to work a little bit harder um, as, a, as, a, as a result. Um, I put in a new manager in. Um, uh, to 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 run it on a day to day basis, um, and when that started to settle down, I looked for a buyer. Okay, because the, because the idea was to 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 buy this and then sell it. I mean, I didn't want to 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 own it. Um, so I should also say that the business itself had shrunk because we stopped doing all the things that made a loss. So we got rid of the video production. We got rid of the uh, the social media. Um, on the web design, that was just horrifically loss making. The most expensive members of staff, um, the, the most number of cu most uh, highest amount of customer problems, um, and, and it's such a competitive business, isn't it? I mean, you've oh, it's terrible. So, so we had all these half finished projects. So I gave all of those to another web design company and said, "Look, hey, here's I don't know how many it was 50, 60, Here's fifty sixty customers for you." Um, uh, you just collect the money that's owed. You know, there's two thousand pounds on this one, five thousand pounds on this one. You finish off the project, that money that's owed. And they were very grateful uh, for us. Everyone was looked after to the very best of our ability, okay. and uh, so we ended up with a smaller business of th about three million pounds a year, but all of it recurring revenue. Okay. So one twelfth of three million, whatever that is, dropping into the bank account on the first working day of every month. I mean, that is a that. That is a thing of beauty, and that was appreciated by the company that bought the, this new business. So we got rid of all of the 
uh, historic HMRC liabilities. We run an ran an administration of all of these old companies and closed them down and bought the assets out of these old companies into the uh, one of the uh, companies that I bought. Actually, it was the 30-year-old company that I bought a couple of years earlier. So now we had this, this sort of new business, if you like, without the shackles of the past, without sort of five years of, of, of history to it. And that process of stripping down all the unprofitable work, stripping out unnecessary costs, and incorporating what was left into the business that you'd already owned took about six months. Yes, um, we couldn't actually do the restructuring till after the six months after six months had, had passed um, because of clauses in our in our purchase agreement uh, around um, uh, with some quite onerous clauses if we had done that sooner. You know, quite frankly, if without those clauses, um, I would have I would have done it in the first. Uh, well, in the first week, <laughs> I right, right, right. would have done it instantly. Um, so we had to drag our heels a little bit on it. But now we've got this, as I always imagine now, that we've gone from this um, uh, 85, 90 people in these two, two-story, two big, huge, uh, huge building, all these uh, company cars outside, um, the senior management being paid um, uh, a million pounds a year in in, in combination uh, to a leaner business with twelve members of staff, one managing director, uh, just doing one thing. All the recurring revenue, doing it far better. Money coming in at the beginning of the month, costs under control. A beautiful business. And I seem to remember this uh, period of your your career quite well because I seem to remember you driving around in a rather splendid Mercedes and when I said you'd been splashing the cash you said no no it was just someone I've just made redundant well I mean <laughs> no I mean oh, come on Ed that's that, that that's I'm it. being harsh I'm being harsh yeah. but it but it was one of those cars there, there, out in the car park yeah, there were there were lots of cars out out in the out in the car park. Absolutely, um, to, to 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 use. Yeah. So that now not being flippant, I want to go back and ask you. You mentioned something that I thought was quite interesting just a minute ago. You said that you bought it into the thirty-year-old company. You'd made this business, and you knew you wanted to sell it. So you bought Absolutely. the businesses, not with the intention of running them at any time. Really, you bought them. Yeah. Talk through that thought process i have always made more money buying and selling companies than i ever have made owning them and running them on a day-to-day -day basis i'm not a good operator really i'm a terrible manager i'm not a good operator i'm not a people person i'm none of those things so um i'm yeah it's, it's great if you can make money while you own the business but i'm really really happy to to not make money while I own the business and, and have my liquidity event when I sell it. And then I take that money and I keep cash and I invest. So I keep part of it in cash. I, I invest part of it in, in uh, typically in property and, uh, and then do it all over again. So, so it's a completely different mentality, I think, where most business owners, it is all about going to the office every day. It is all about managing the people. It's all about hiring and firing and looking after the cut. And it is, it is all that stuff. Now, I get that because I've done that myself. I know what I know what that is like, and I also know what it's like to hire someone on thirty thousand a year to do that for me. Yeah. Because I would rather pay someone thirty thousand a year and not have that that nightmare of I don't know. I'm trying to think of all the nightmares. Well, all the admin and all the people issues and the staffing issues and all of that. Just give that to someone else. Um, where so my time then was taken up looking for for a buyer. Um, uh, we uh, presented this to a, to a number of companies, and we found a very good home for it uh, in a, with a, a company called Ad Media Group, um, and uh, very um, very very professional people knew exactly what they were doing. Didn't have to explain to them what the business was. Um, they got it. They were aware of the the, the old entity. Um, and were quite happy to, uh, to to buy the business, and we did a, 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 a deal that everyone was very very happy with. I'm sure you were. I need to rein you in a bit because you've described the selling process as as I mean a lot of people will be listening. 
wanting to learn about the sales process and right. the sales process you've summarized in about 15 seconds. You're six months in, you've created this business, you want to sell it. How did you meet this company that then did go on and buy it? What was the sales process? I did the exact reverse of what I teach people to do when looking for a business to buy. So I went and looked for a business that would buy us. So I, okay. uh, w- w- and we have a number of tactics that we teach to the Deal Makers Academy in order to do this. So I, I basically re- reversed the process. Instead of looking for a business that I wanted to buy, I'm looking for a business I wanted to buy us. Um, and uh, uh, so again, ran a number of meetings um, and put the deal together. And again, sorry, I'm summarizing it very, very quickly. But you know, we, we got to the point of a, of a, of a deal that everyone was uh, happy with. Uh, if you think about it, everything to me was upside because the purchase price was a pound. So Absolutely. Everything, everything was upside. And, uh, and, it, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a multi-million pound upside. So I know sometimes people say to me at, at, at my live seminars, they say, Jonathan, that was in 11 months. So, um, so I bought it on May the 3rd, sold it March 24th the following year. So it's about 11 months, May the 3rd, March 24th. How can you justify making so much in an 11 month period. Some people have to, well, some people will never earn that in a lifetime of turning up at the office. And this is how I justify it. I justify it by saying anyone could have done what I did. There is nothing stopping anyone from doing it, but I saw the opportunity. I had the team around me to be able to act on the opportunity. I already had the lawyers, the accountants, the due diligence people, the HR people, I knew what I was doing and I was able to implement quickly and I was able to clean up this mess of, I think it was about seven or eight companies that we had to buy to get to the bit that we wanted. You know, I haven't even mentioned what I did with Australia. I haven't mentioned what I did with the franchisees. Yeah, you know, there right. were all these different, different deals were happening, uh, sort of sub deals, if you like, along the way. And then we did the, the, the large deal at the end. So, I did a lot of work. I mean, I worked hard during that period. I only went to the office about nine times. So I went up to their office nine times during that period because I put a manager in there to look after it. For me, that's the nightmare of going to the office. But, but I did all the cleaning up. Um, I coordinated the lawyers and the accountants to end up with what we wanted. And we ended up with this lovely company producing three million pounds of revenue, recurring revenue a year, highly, highly profitable um, because it only required a handful of staff. Our acquirer already had those staff. I think they took on a couple of hours and, and let the, the rest go. Um, and we ended up with a, a deal that everyone was, was happy, happy with. I mean, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. And I mean, would you, would you leave listeners to this particular episode with anything more than anyone can do it? Well, yeah, let me just qualify that. Anyone can do it if they know what they're doing <laughs> um, and uh, they have the right team to support them. Um, and uh, yeah, they're the two main, main things, really. So let, let's, let's just think about this. Anyone can do it if they want to do it, if they're prepared to put in the effort, prepared to learn how to do it, um, and then go out and implement because you can have all the knowledge in the world. If you don't implement it, uh, then it really means nothing. So absolutely, anyone can do this with those caveats. Excellent. Excellent. So that was a digital marketing business. You now run a day nursery business. And I believe in the next episode, we're going to talk about an earlier business you bought and sold, uh, which was a coaching and training business. Yeah, absolutely. So, so really, the principles are exactly the same. I'm just doing it again and again in different sectors, because, you know, the, Businesses operate in the same way. Um, I've got some very clear criteria about the sort of businesses that I'm interested in and not interested in. I never do something that I don't understand, for example. So anything te- technological, forget it. I've got, <laughs> it's not, that's not my thing at all. As I know that you know, Ed. Yeah, so, I do um, indeed. So, yes, in the next episode, we'll talk about a, a similar process that I did in a different sector because I want to prove the point to our podcast listeners that you can do this 
in in any sector, um, and uh, you can apply it to the sector that you're in currently. And I'm going to be going on about this a lot over the next few months. Now is the time to find those one pound deals. Yeah, if they're going to be available at any point this decade, it's right now. It's 2020, right now. 2021. This is where they're going to be. Well, it looks like this lockdown is going to last for a while longer. So uh, we'll talk about more of those businesses, same term, same place next week. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ed.